The SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, founded in 1911, is now the only institution of higher learning in the United States dedicated solely to the study of natural resources and the environment. Hello and welcome to this edition of Improve Your World with SUNY ESF. I'm Dave White. In today's program, we will introduce you to the plant dubbed the Supermarket of the Swamp, an effort to increase sustainability by reducing the use of energy in the buildings around the ESF quad, and we'll share in the adventure of a road trip in a truck that runs on wood gas. We begin at Cranberry Lake in the western Adirondack Mountains. Some days, just getting to your classroom can be a bit more challenging. <laughs> Maybe you should check her for leeches. So, we are here, as you know, to gather cattails, and we're going to need lots of them because um, there's a way in which you can think of the cattail as, as the supermarket of the, of the swamp. Um, almost everything that we would need, um, we can get from this plant. Um, one of the reasons you know that we're, we're coming to, to gather this is because it is what kind of plant? Fibrous. It's fibrous, exactly. And you know that because of the? The long stalks, the parallel venation, it's a monocot, isn't it? Yeah, okay. So one of the one of the virtues of the plant is we can make we can make miles of cordage from, from this and you can make it from the fresh leaf. Feel this leaf. Every, everybody can get a little bit of this. It's slimy on the inside, we'll talk about that. Here you go. What's it tell me about the squeeze it a little. Squeeze the base of that leaf. It's like spongy. Uh, Greg, wasn't it you yesterday who said aranchyma, right? Okay, look at the base of this. Yeah, the slime is very, we'll get to the slime. It's like aloe vera. This is actually, it's, it's wonderful. It's antimicrobial. You're all into the slime, so let's talk about it. The slime, <laughs> the slime which you might think is some icky jelly, is actually um, full of protein and it's really soothing. Anybody have a, sin, a sunburn? Not yet. Yeah, okay, <laughs> um, it's like aloe vera. Um, and the plant makes this because think about how it's growing. It's growing down in, the, in that, all that organic matter where there are lots of microbes, right? Um, and so it's making an antimicrobial water holding jelly to protect itself from the environment. And then there it is for you. Um, so it's, it's a wonderful sort of soothing antimicrobial salve full of protein as you can tell. And so now we get to this part and it's all spongy. What kind of cells are we talking here? Starch storage. Remember those parenchyma cells? Yeah, this is pure parenchyma. Rick, you're going to be our guinea pig? Just break a little off. Break a little off. Here. Break a little off. We're eating it. Yeah, we're eating it. It's crisp. It's cool. Tastes like a cucumber. And it's full of starch. It's absolutely full of starch. So remember what we said in our, our inventory of resources in the forest? There was not enough carbohydrate. Ta-da! Here's your carbohydrate. We can shake that yellow pollen out of the male cattail, and pollen is pure protein. You put a little paper bag over that and just kind of tap it, and you'll shake out all of the yellow pollen. You get maybe a couple of tablespoons of it, and it's pure protein. You just add it right into your flour, um, pancakes. It's delicious, and, and it's really good for you. This plant is also water repellent. So it's water repellent, insulating, and soft. What better thing to make mats out of? Um, this, it's an amazing plant. Um, and you can make cordage out of the leaf. Now, if that weren't good enough, here you go, um, where if we t start taking this apart further, and this is what we're going to do when we get back to camp, we have to strip all of these. Why don't you all take them so you can start playing with them, enjoying them. We're going to take all of this apart, lay them out on the lawn to dry so that we can make them into mats. It floats, exactly, so this floats like rushes. And where else do you see closed cell foam? In insulation. 
in insulation. So think about making this into a, a wall of your wigwam. It's insulating, um, it's soft, these make wonderful sleeping mats because of the arenchyma. It's got food, it's got medicine, it's got rope, it's got mattresses, it's got walls for your wigwam. So the utility of, of cattail isn't limited to its material. Today we're making a wigwam. Um, it's one of the activities we do in ethnobotany, which is the class I'm taking right now. This is one of our biggest projects that we do here. We've done a lot of other baskets and stuff, but this is kind of our big group project um, for ethnobotany. We started working on it uh, two days ago um, and did the basic frame. It took a surprisingly long time to find the actual location, um, but then once we got all the math done and um, put all the saplings in the right place, it came together really fast. There's just a couple basic materials you need. Um, you just need some saplings, preferably beech, and um, we found that striped maple works real bendable, um, uh, pliable wood. Um, maples don't really work, they don't bend as well. Um, you could use cordage made from white spruce root or, you know, um, some type of cordage made from the field from like dog bane or um, tomorrow we're getting cattails, cattails would work. At the beginning we kind of had a little, uh, a little spit, I guess there were way too many mines involved in one thing, but then once we finally split up and went and did our different jobs, it worked out really nicely. We're going to use the birch bark over there and we're going to use the grass mats made out of the cattails, um, but we haven't learned how to do the grass mats yet, we'll learn that tomorrow. Wigwams aren't supposed to be really permanent. Um, traditionally they were used for just small fishing camps um, or berry picking camps so um, traditionally they'd be built somewhere just for a season. Um, so they don't actually, they don't stay that long but the ones that we've seen are up to like seven years old and they're still standing. They don't have all the bark and stuff on them still but they're pretty long lasting. It's, uh, I've learned a lot, you know, making cordage like I said. Um, the spruce roots, that was cool. Um, being able to tie things off with it and without it breaking. Um, but yeah, it's really useful information. I mean, making teas and tinctures and all that, I'll be able to use that when I'm older and plan on it, actually. When I'm old and retired, I'll be able to go out, find some uh, tea plants and make some tea if I just get the urge. I can't even put into words how good it feels to like just make stuff and, and have a product that you feel really good about and that you know, the earth has given you, you know, it's not like buying something in the store, you know, you could buy a basket for two bucks, but when you spend like, I literally spent like 14 hours yesterday making my basket, and now I'm like really excited about it, so it feels really good. That's what's really nice, that it's all just going to go back into the earth. Ethnobotany is one of several courses taught during the summer months at the ESF Cranberry Lake Biological Station. Another is fungal diversity an introduction to the collection, identification, and ecology of fungi and fungal-like organisms. After collecting samples in the forest, the students head back into the lab to figure out what they found. We'll go and look at some of the collections you got this morning, and then I think we'll cook up some of the edible fungi we found over the last couple of days, because I want to have them before I go home, and that should do us for this afternoon, okay? The way we normally uh, as scientists look at whether we've exhaustively collected, whether it's plants or insects or fungi or whatever, is we have a species accumulation curve. And so that basically measures the number of, number of species or the number of new species versus effort or time or number of visits to the site, etc., etc., etc. How many times would, it be, would you need to come here to get an idea of total plant diversity. Would once do it? Two or three times a season. No. Why not? You have to come over the various seasons. So you want to come at least a few times. Would you want to just do one year or more than one year? Multiple years. How many? Uh, three. Okay, maybe two or three years. So let's say you came three times a year for three years. That's nine visits. Let's say I'm paying you like ten bucks an hour. So that's <laughs> It's not costing too much. To do the same for the fungi though would require much greater effort. We have to somehow give some figures and what scientists have done in order to at least get the debate going is they have used ratios. The 5% we know we use to make predictions about all the things we don't know. 
And if you're making predictions based on 5%, it's pretty shaky ground to be on. All we can do is just intensively sample particular sites and substrates and see how that fits with these pictures that we're developing on the ratio of 6 to 1. And as I mentioned the other day, if you go to the North Pole, that ratio is going to be more like 200 to 1. If you go to the South Pole, it's going to be something similar. Now you've seen in the last week how quickly something can appear, how quickly it can disappear. You get a big rainstorm, next day they're popping all over the place. So if you're one of those people in Africa and you don't happen to be in the right place at the right time, you're never going to see that thing. And it's going to be very difficult to get a handle on just what's there. When we go on expeditions somewhere or other, we come back with tons and tons and tons of species. And most of them just get shoved away into a drawer and forgotten about. And you might work on the most, like the, the top 10 inter interesting ones, and then the rest get forgotten about. Is it really important to put a name on everything? There are reasons why we might want to name everything. And we could just name everything, we just, you know, give it just a common name. And obviously that's not very meaningful. But instead of spending 40 years looking at the biology of this one species, where it comes out in the tree allows us to make some predictions. Likewise, something might come out in a group that we know is really toxic to humans. And we might want to know something about that and study that more. So this provides us with a great shortcut for getting to the biology of all these unknown species. However, in order for this to work, we need to have the backbone. We need to have the structure to the tree. And that's what we're working on right now. You see, they don't tell. I found yeah. it here, though. Here yeah, at the bio station. Oh, yeah. We've already eaten some of this this week, but that's just... Uh, do a little more. These are, these are single and they're never on wood, never on a log. And you can tell this is a chanterelle, obviously, because it's got these very decurrent gills that run down the stipe. Uh, really, they're not actually true grill, gills, they're more like ridges than they are gills, if you look at them closely. So this is a group of fungi that the gills are very much reduced on. Really only one thing you can mistake it for, maybe two things you can mistake it for. One is called the false chanterelle, and that is much more common in sort of coniferous woodland. Um, much redder in color, orangey red color rather than this yellow. And that would make you sick. If you made the mistake, that would definitely make you sick. And it's a very unique class in that you get to eat your research. Just make sure you eat the right research. Institutions like the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry are working to lower their carbon footprint, and one easy way to do that is by conserving on the use of energy. And one easy way to do that is to turn out some lights in a process called delamping, and that can be used even in a place like this, Moon Library. <clears throat> Conservation plays a vital role in, uh, in saving energy, saving dollars. It's uh, usually something uh, that is very low cost or free to do and uh, can save you money, can save energy. People often think of uh, efficiency by changing out and putting in more efficient equipment. That usually takes an investment. A lot of times conserving can be something that we can make use of less energy and still get the uh, the service that we need, the lighting, the heating, and things that we need. And the overall picture is delamping might be one term for it because one of the suggestions or the outcomes may be reducing the number of lights or replacing them with some other kind of light. And the cost is not that much, especially if you capitalize it over a few years. So if you're paying $800 or $900 for a whole bunch of lighting replacements for one building, you capitalize that over two or three years, and by that time, you've made up your replacement cost by energy savings, especially because LEDs last a lot longer. Therefore, you'd be replacing them less often. Now, one of the things we looked at doing, um, we evaluate whether we want to put in more efficient lights so that we'd get the same light with, uh, with less energy. But near term, one of the things we can do without spending any money is look at areas that have more light than we need take out some light bulbs, de-lamp, if you will, and uh, by taking out some of those light bulbs, 
we save energy. The students went through one building, Marshall Hall, and did what we call a sort of a lighting survey. And basically they're trying to figure out how many lights there are, you know, where the lights within each room, and how long are they kept on during the day. And then they can propose actual solutions to try to reduce the amount of energy used for lighting. Something that the Green Campus Initiative has done, uh, it's a club on campus that is full of students that are dedicated to kind of greening our campus and making it more sustainable and just kind of getting the community to see what we do and how they can do things to change and be more sustainable as well. I'm in charge of the energy uh, committee within the club and we just were looking for a project and there was um, a class that I was in with uh, Professor Smartin that looked at the lights on campus and we decided to help them out and do the library. In, in some cases, yes, there, there may be over lighting for, for some of the areas versus the actual usage of that area. For instance, if I'm in an office, I don't need a whole lot of lighting. Whereas in the classroom, maybe we need a little bit more lighting. And the question is, how many foot candles do we actually need to do the job for that space? The hallways are probably one of the easiest places to look at lowering lighting because people are usually just walking through there, not doing any reading. A uh, little trickier when you get into people's offices, but uh, we can do it a couple ways. We can actually remove light bulbs, or if people are conscientious, we can get them to turn them off. But uh, human beings, you know, we're never as, uh, as reliable as anybody would like. We forget to turn them off when we're leaving the office or something. So if we can uh, reduce some lighting, um, and uh, by removing light bulbs, then it's a more uh, permanent, you know, more uh, 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 consistent way to save some energy. You know, we don't want to ever reduce the lighting levels to a point where um, people don't like the lighting levels. We just want to look at areas where we might have too much lighting. I, we grew up, yeah, at least I did, where, you know, my grandparents and my parents would tell you that, you, you know, you should turn a light on when you're reading because otherwise your eyes will go bad and, you know, and you'll ruin your eyes reading in, in the dark. Turn another light on. And, and I, I think we tend to do that. We've gone through an era where we light up all of our outdoor areas in the name of safety and security. Uh, we leave porch lights on all the time. We leave floodlights on in our driveways. We have solar-powered lights lighting our walkways. We carry flashlights around when we go camping. So yes, I think we do overlight. I, I, I think we do it indoors. I think we do it outdoors. And uh, you know, um, and and there are a lot of sources to that historically and culturally. I guess socially. Uh, personally, I don't mind it being a little darker. Um, I think some of the build the rooms are a little too late. We, uh, we talked about a plan to do it on a test basis, looking at you know, doing part of the library at, one, you know, at a time, and then, uh, and then went from there. Basically, we went through last semester and counted all the light bulbs in the library. And we went through and we're going to try and, uh, with the, um, the physical plant here and Mike Kelleher, go through and find out which ones we can take out to try and um, just to save some energy cost. Some students came to us uh, and were interested in reducing the lighting levels in the library, which might be the last place you would think of uh, reducing lighting levels because people are reading in the library. There's skylights in there. There's, a, I think, three skylights on, on, skylights on each side of the main desk, and there's bulbs underneath them directly, directly under them. And I thought, and I was sitting there one day, and I looked up, and I was like, the sun's out which is rare in Syracuse, but uh, it was out and there was plenty of light. And I thought, we asked uh, Steve uh, if he would mind turning off some of the lights, and we did, and it got pretty dark, but if you were to take just those bulbs under the skylights to start, I mean, stuff like that we looked up and saw and thought maybe we could take out. So I was a little concerned uh, that we not make it too dark in here for study, for adequate academic work to be conducted, um, especially in the areas where we don't have the skylights and adequate and natural lighting coming into the building. If you know the garage show, Mark's quote, you know, outside of a dog, a book is man's best friend. Inside of a dog, it's too dark to read. But uh, but I was willing to work with them, and and Andrew presented a pretty good case, and we talked about some different things that could happen. Yeah, you can uh, replace the fixtures, use more energy efficient bulbs, which I think the school has done a good job in. One is replacing every other light, and then you could further save money by replacing the kind of lighting, say the LEDs. I know some of the classrooms are a little older, and they were you no know, the fixtures were already in there, but you know some of them can be uh, upgraded and changed. 
sensors, light sensors, if you're not in a room for a long time, they'll go off. We're going to test that in, uh, in Bray Hall. Um, there's uh, an energy audit that we've done, and that's one of the measures that we're going to implement. It'll, in addition to that, um, like in the Gateway Building, one of the things we'll do is also look at controls that will harvest daylight. So in part of the library right now, it's summertime, there's skylights, uh, the library has turned off a whole bunch of lights. Um, so that's a manual way of doing it. But there are control technologies that uh, determine how much natural light there is and will dim or turn off lights uh, uh, in order to save energy as well. The new building like uh, uh, Baker, the new building was uh, I think are going to be or attempted to be LEED certified and they built it with that in mind and they have motion sensors and all kinds of things. Yeah, I think educational institutions um, might have a little more interest in things that are low cost like delamping. So Mike Kelleher, who's the sustainability operations officer for the campus, is utilizing this work as well as the lighting survey for Elick Hall, which was done by another graduate student, as part of the campus effort toward being more sustainable or more green. Um, we've uh, delamped this half of the library, uh, taking out every other bulb, and we took a look, and, and then once that was done, and that took a couple of weeks because we needed time and, and labor from physical plant to do that, we, um, now there were a couple of areas I told, I asked them not to remove bulbs from, including particularly in front of the copiers and the printers where people were constantly working uh, over the service desk where we have no skylights and the natural light from the door doesn't reach. But other than that, I told them they could do this whole side and then we would take some light meter readings and see where we were at, where that fell within standards. So we took measurements where they had delamped and we took measurements where they haven't yet and uh, where they have taken out the light bulbs, half of them, even at night, because we did the measurements, the first set of measurements at night, we were well over 30 foot candles. Anything over 30 is considered good. Uh, we are over 30 in every area where they've taken out the light bulbs. I haven't had any negative feedback whatsoever, um, I, but I haven't heard the students say one way or another. I think people hardly notice sometimes. So you get you get in the perceptual issue, right? Do how you know? Do people really notice things? And I don't think they really notice. I did, I've done some environmental psychology studies in terms of surveying people. There's the function, right? What do you need to actually do the things? And then there's what people notice, which is like the preference or the or the perception side of it. So there's function versus perception, and you have to work with both those issues. What I noticed this morning at about 10 o'clock or 10:30 was the this side of the library that has been delamped. They had about twice as many people sitting here as the side that hadn't been. To demonstrate that biomass can be a viable alternative as a renewable energy resource, two researchers converted a pickup truck to run on gasified wood. Then they proved it would work by taking their truck on a 420 mile trip. The big test of a truck that runs on wood gas begins on the SUNY ESF campus with Rick Bates at the wheel. I became interested in wood gasification when I was very young. When I was probably 10 years old, I saw a uh, World War II movie on TV in which the hero escaped with a whole orphanage uh, full of kids in a school bus that was powered by coconut shells. And they successfully drove from Syracuse to Messina and back, almost entirely wood gas, according to paper and bioprocess engineering professor Dr. Klaus Dubay. We are trying to prove the sustainability of basically wood material usable for powering an engine that could be powering an engine for, uh, for a vehicle or could be as a stationary application to produce energy, electricity, energy or heat. 20 pounds of wood equaling one gallon. Smoke comes up here, comes through here. Now all this stuff in here is basically uh, air mixer valves uh, so I can mix in the proper amount of outside air and it just goes into your air cleaner. Mm. And, uh, runs the engine. They traveled north on Route 81 from Syracuse, 
as you can see from the video Dr. Dulé took while following the wood gas truck in their supply vehicle. Reaching Watertown, they made their way to Route 3 and overnighted in Wanakina. And then the next day, it was north to Messina on Route 56. So Rick is refueling it again. Uh, it's our third refueling stop. The system produces quite a bit of smoke when first started, but as you can see, that's not the case out on the highway. The round trip was 420 miles, and they used about one and a quarter pounds of wood per mile. A few days earlier, Rick gave us a tour of his PhD project. This is the wood fuel that the, that the gasifier uses. It's just uh, short hunks of, of branches okay. varying between one and a half to three inches in diameter. When operating the uh, gasifier, uh, I put the wood in through the top here. Uh, the reason the top is spring-loaded is because occasionally the gasifier systems have been known to uh, puff or undergo small explosions. And if you, you don't want to have it fastened down tightly because then you might blow out something important. After I have it loaded up with wood, I start a, a small heater uh, type blower that draws a slight vacuum on this whole system here. That's just to get the air flowing through the gasifier. And that's what does it. The next step I would do is to open up the air inlet and I would light it with my propane torch. Rough equivalents uh, for wood versus gasoline you get uh, about 20 pounds of wood equaling one gallon. The engine vacuum is drawing the smoke through the fire in reverse of the way it would normally occur. It's drawing it down through the bottom of the fire and out through this pipe here. After the smoke leaves here, the hot gas leaves the cyclone filter and goes through this pipe there into the top of the radiator. And there the gas is cooled to room temperature. It then goes through this pipe here into a big hay filter, which is in that 55 gallon drum. Um, after it leaves the hay filter, it goes out through the top there, leaves the filter through this pipe here, and goes down underneath the truck. The wood gas comes up from underneath the truck through this pipe here, goes into this area where it's mixed with air, mm -hmm. and then is sucked into the engine air cleaner. What our research project is about is all kinds of uh, lignocellulose containing biomass, uh, run it in the gasifier and prove basically the concept and also improve actually the gasifier itself, the operation, to get basically more energy out per pound of feedstock. We're also not looking also into uh, woody biomass, we also want to look into maybe rubber tires, because rubber tires or tires are basically thrown out after their, their usage. So they're used in cement kilns for firing them, but we also yeah, we think there also might be a viable uh, product to use in a gasifier. That's all for this edition of Improve Your World with SUNY ESF. I'm Dave White, and I hope you'll join us again next time.